From the most recent addition to the Nash Holos Music Library, that was Andriana with a song from her brand new CD, Songs from Home, and that was called Zabuta Dorijenka, Forgotten Road, a song about a young girl who meets a charming soldier who promises to return and marry her, and the question is, will he return? Andriana from her CD, Pisnis Domu, Songs from Home, and Zabuta Dorzhenka, Forgotten Road. Dobry večer, šenovni radio suhači, ta vitaju vas vsih na radio predaču Naš Holos, radio Našoho Korinja. Kot rapodijac je vam, jak svečajno, što sobote o šosti hodeni na bohatomovni radio stanci AM 1320 CHMB u misci Vancouveri i pomareži PCJ Radio Mižnorodnomu. Pri mikrofoni Pelvina Makwari djakuju što ve bila sukačama srednji večeri ta rišala para buta zimnoju na stupnu hodenu. Hello there and welcome to Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio here on AM 1320 CHMB Vancouver and in international syndication on PCJ Radio International. I'm Paula Demchuk Makwari, Pukarinska Pavlina, and I'm delighted to have you with me. We've got a great program lined up for you. We have a Ukrainian recipe, a Ukrainian Christmas recipe actually, and it's one of 12 we'll be sharing from the Nash Holos Audio Archives this Christmas season in this and the Nanaimo editions of the show through to January 5th. We've also got a uh, Ukrainian Jewish heritage and an interview with Alison Zivin of the Felstein Society and Karen Gershon of Project Kesher, both in New York City, and we'll be speaking about the work they're doing together in Ukraine. As well, we've also got our usual proverb of the week, other items of interest, and great Ukrainian music. And this is uh, the last program of the year that is not going to be Christmas programming. So we're going to really kick up our heels and uh, maybe sneak in a little pre-Christmas tune here and there. But for the most part, strap on those dancing boots. It is going to be an hour of great dance music. So coming up next, Ukrainia from Ottawa and a song about that wise guy, Yarema. Отсе я родився літо на зорі, мудрі були люди, родичі мої, куми в нас кликали, церкву отвели, і ім'я Ярема мені надали.
Yarema. Thanks to the foresight and generosity of its donors, the Taras Shevchenko Foundation has been investing in the future of the Ukrainian-Canadian community for over 50 years. Since 1963, the Taras Shevchenko Foundation has been funding initiatives that strengthen our Ukrainian-Canadian identity and enhance our Ukrainian-Canadian cultural heritage. These include fine and performing arts and arts groups, museums, cultural centers, education, as well as authors, journalists, and the Ukrainian-Canadian media, including this program. The Foundation strives to become the premier not-for-profit foundation in a Canada which acknowledges the Ukrainian-Canadian community as a fundamental component of Canadian society. Nash Hollis listeners are encouraged to support this vision through continued donations into the future. To apply for grants, make a donation, or for more information, visit ShochenkoFoundation.com. Canada's National Ukrainian Festival in Dauphin, Manitoba offers the very best in Ukrainian culture, music, food and dancing August long weekend. Right now, your early bird weekend pass is only $90 and includes all of the on-site attractions. It's a perfect stocking stuffer. Day passes and camping passes are also available. Don't miss Canada's National Ukrainian Festival in Dauphin, Manitoba, August 2nd to 4th. Order your tickets and more info at cnuf.ca. from Winnipeg from their second CD Let's Ask the Polka Band and a traditional Ukrainian folk song done in a real nice polka style as Sluhai is wont to do and that was Oipit Hayim Hayim in the Grove.
And up next, Prairie Crocus, also from Winnipeg, from their CD, Back Up and Push. And you're going to need to grab another couple because you'll be doing the Highland Shotis. <laughs> Up next, from the Nasholos Audio Archives, Ukrainian Food Flare. Hello! Tiny stuffed dumplings can be found in many different cuisines. Italians call their pasta tortellini, and the Chinese have their own wonton. Ukrainian vushka, which means little ear dumplings, are served in clear broth and specifically with borscht at Christmas Eve. There is no substitute for them. The dough is a light, soft dough. Use your own favorite vareniki or pierogi dough, or try mine. The filling is traditionally a mixture of wild mushrooms and onion. Now for the recipe. Two cups flour, one teaspoon salt, one egg yolk, half cup whole milk, one teaspoon oil or melted butter. Combine the flour and salt, add milk, egg, yolk, and oil. Mix well. Let stand or rest for five minutes. Then knead for five minutes. Cover and set aside for 15 minutes. 
On a floured surface, roll out a third of the dough into a rectangle a quarter of an inch thick. Make sure the dough is even in thickness when rolling. Flip dough over, flour again, and with a sharp knife, cut into one and a half inch squares. Place a teaspoon of mushroom filling in each square, being careful not to smear edges. Fold diagonally to make a triangle. Make sure the dough is bonded or the stuffing will boil out. Then make them into little ears by pinching together two bottom corners, leaving the top tip pointing out. Place on cookie sheets covered with towels, dusted with flour. Drop 10 to 12 vushka into 6 to 8 cups of rapid boiling water and stir once with a wooden spoon. Do not cover. When they float to the top, cook one minute longer, then remove with a slotted spoon. Cool on a lightly oiled plate without crowding. Repeat until all are cooked. Place four to five vushka in soup plates and pour hot borscht over them. Now, here's the mushroom filling. Two tablespoons oil, one onion finely chopped, one pound mushrooms finely chopped, three tablespoons bread crumbs, approximately, salt and pepper to taste, and freshly chopped dill. Sauté onion in oil until tender. Add mushrooms and sauté until tender. Season to taste with salt and pepper and chopped dill. Add enough breadcrumbs to bind the filling. Cool before using. Try it. You'll love it. It's Ukrainian. This has been Ukrainian Food Flare from the Nasholos Audio Archives. If you'd like a copy of this recipe for yourself or for a special someone else, then check out our Patreon page and sign up as a patron there. Collections of recipes as heard on Nasholos is just one of the rewards for supporters of the show, and from now until January 5th, patrons will receive an ebook and or print copy of Ukrainian Christmas recipes. That's Patreon spelled P A T R E O N patreon.com and do a search for Nasholos. Or you can get the link at our website www.nasholos.com. Meanwhile, I'll be sharing Ukrainian Christmas recipes from our audio archives here on Nasholos from now until January 5th, two different recipes a week on our Vancouver show, which airs Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific time on AM 1320 CHMB Vancouver and in international syndication, as well as on our Nanaimo edition, which airs on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on CHLY 101.7 FM. A link to our podcast as well as our Patreon page can be found at our website www.nasholos.com. Up next is Millennia from Edmonton from their CD Bracha, their third, and a song about a girl going to pick mushrooms. And at this time of year, about the only place you'll be picking mushrooms for your vushka is in a supermarket. Here's Millennia now with Pohrebe Chodela went to pick mushrooms. <music> Ай я чуня, мамички, не спала, мамички, не спала, 
розум дівки. А я чорня банічки, не спала нічки, не спала з долею гуляла. А я чорня банічки, не спала нічки, не спала з долею Every day, more Ukrainian soldiers are killed or wounded by Russian invaders. You can help wounded heroes by joining the Adopt a Soldier program of registered charity Ukraine War Amps. A small monthly donation goes very far for medical services and living expenses and creates a special bond between you and a wounded hero. 100% of your contribution goes to the soldier. Please, adopt a soldier today. Visit ukrainewaramps.ca or find us on Facebook. slowing things down just a little bit. Uh, another group from Winnipeg, the Ukrainian Old Timers, one of the most prolific recording groups uh, in Ukrainian Canadian history, I think. And from their CD, Volume 16, No More Bread and Butter, that was the Sweet Fern Walls featuring Lawrence Eichley and Bill Sturbachuk. This is CHMB, AM 1320, Vancouver. Vancouver. 
And now for a look at Ukraine's rich Jewish heritage, then and now, brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter based in Toronto, Ontario. This is Pavlina, producer and host of Nosh Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio. Last spring, we first spoke with Alan Bernstein, president of the Felstein Society in New York, about his organization's upcoming centenary commemoration of a horrible pogrom that took place in 1919 in a shtetl in Ukraine called Felstein, now Hvardiska. Just a few weeks ago, he told us about an amazing connection the society has made with a Catholic priest and school principal in Hvardiska who plan to take an active role in the commemorations. The Felstein Society's commemorations will be taking place in the spring of 2019, and we will hear from them again closer to the time. Meanwhile, it was Alison Zivin of the Felstein Society who initially contacted Nash Holos with information about their project. Alison is also involved with other projects pertaining to Ukrainian Jewish heritage, including work with a group called Project Kesher. Project Kesher focuses on helping Jewish women in Ukraine and other parts of the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe to regain their Jewish identity in a post-Soviet and post-Holocaust environment. Karen Gershon is the executive director of Project Kesher, also headquartered in New York. Recently, both of these amazing women kindly took time out of their busy schedules to speak with us on Skype about their work. So let's start first with um, Allison and the Felshin Society's connection with Project Kesher. How did you two get connected up? So one of the projects that the Felstein Society has been working on is to figure out a way to educate people about the nearly 200,000 victims of pogroms that took place across uh, Ukraine and Belarus following the Russian Revolution. And it's, you know, it's obviously a huge genocide. Um, It was what many scholars say was the seeding that enabled the Holocaust to happen, and yet it's a footnote in the Jewish history books. And with that background, we've been reaching out to rabbis at synagogues and JCCs and other organizations around the U.S. and around the world to ask them to plan commemorative events. And um, that's been great, but a little bit slow going because it's really a labor intensive effort to have conversations Mm -hmm. with each individual rabbi. Mm -hmm. And then I came up with the idea that there were nonprofit organizations that ran many different groups, such as Project Kesher, across what was the former Soviet Union and thought, oh, wow, they would have outreach to many different people that could help spread this message and educate people. And I reached out to Karen at Project Kesher, and she was very enthusiastic about the idea. So what is it that's different that you're doing then with Project Kesher that's related to the the, um, pogrom commemoration? It's not really anything that's that different. It's just a way to both spread the word about the pogroms as well as to help educate people in the former Soviet Union about this era that was part of their Jewish heritage. And so I believe Karen is asking her group leaders over there to plan different types of commemorations. And it can be anything from from reading a book about the pogroms and having a discussion about it, to showing a film, to um, asking people to Mm -hmm. bring in pictures of their ancestors and share stories that they've heard, um, to having a candlelight vigil or some other more prayer-based commemoration. Okay. Uh, When we spoke with, uh, Alan was explaining to me, um, as you just did, that uh, it's pretty hard to to get the word out to to all these people. And JCCs, by the way, is Jewish Community Centers? Correct. Okay. So, of course, everybody in North America were spread out, of course, and around the world. And in Ukraine, of course, the Jewish community is just rebuilding. And that is where Project Kesher comes in, I suppose. And um, Karen, maybe tell us a little bit about Project Kesher, you've you've got a, quite an extensive network that you've been building. So when did it start and, and what was the catalyst? So um, in the late 1980s, when the free Soviet Jewry movement was getting very strong, one of Project Kesher's founders, Sally Gratch, a social worker from Evanston, Illinois, went to Moscow on a walk from Moscow to then Leningrad. It was a peace march, and she discovered that many of the people in the Jewish community 
were not openly Jewish any longer, Mm -hmm. but that they were active in the peace movement. The following year, she convinced her husband, Alan Gratch, to take a Fulbright scholarship, and they moved together to Kiev, Ukraine, so that he could teach law while she went out to look to see if there were more Jews living throughout Ukraine who would be interested in rebuilding Jewish life. And that's when we really got started. It was in the early 90s. In 1994, Sally connected with so many Jewish women in the region that she kicked off the first international conference of Jewish women in Kiev, bringing together about 200 uh, Jewish women from around the world to meet all the Jewish women who were starting to emerge in Ukraine. Things have changed so dramatically since that time. You know, when we started there, I think people really saw Jews as a separate part of the population. People were Ukrainian and then they were Jewish. Right. But today, particularly since the 2014 revolution, most Jews in the region would talk about themselves as Ukrainian Jews. And I think that one of the reasons why we're so interested in this project is that I think it's so important that all of Ukrainian society reconcile with a lot of the horrors that came before in Ukrainian life. Mm -hmm. There were the pogroms, there was Holodomor, and of course there was the Holocaust. And I think that citizens of Ukraine as a whole have to make peace with what came before so that they can transition to being a really vibrant democracy and a pluralist and inclusive society. Mm -hmm. So we are thrilled to be given the opportunity to work with other organizations, both Jewish and non-Jewish, really to understand Ukraine's history so that they can move really effectively into their future. Yes, and I'm seeing that this is uh, very much becoming a trend. I'm speaking with a lot of people, uh, Ukrainians, who are Jewish heritage or not Jewish heritage, and that's how they feel they are. They are Ukrainian, whether they're Jewish or Christian or Muslim or whatever, or nothing, you know, like no religion. They are Ukrainian first, so they're creating a kind of a cohesiveness. Um you're doing work not just in Ukraine, but you're doing work throughout um, other countries. Are you having the same sort of thing going on in other in the other countries you're involved in? Well, it is a particularly exciting time in Ukraine. I've been there twice in the last four months. And I would say that every time I go right now, it is so exhilarating because the entire country is moving towards a really vibrant democracy as fast as it can. And while there are certainly hurdles, you do see an incredible uh, movement. You see more money starting to come through the system. You know, I I was walking down the street one day and saw 20 new ambulances being prepared to go out into the territories, uh, the different, you know, oblasts. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very exciting time in Ukraine. Belarus is interesting because due to the tensions between Ukraine and Russia, Belarus has had sanctions lifted. And they're sort of serving as, I guess, what they would call an honest broker in the region. And a lot of the different issues that are being resolved are are being done so on Belarusian territory. And so for the first time in ages, there's actually money filtering into Belarus. And you can see the loosening of their economy and a loosening of many of their different, their rights. People are are more forthcoming than they used to be, a lot more Mm -hmm. conversation. I was in Moscow about three weeks ago. And, you know, I think it's so important to always remember that our relationship right now between the United States and Russia that we're paying attention to is at the governmental level. Mm -hmm. And that is so dysfunctional. But at the people level, the vast majority of people in Russia, you know, their values are not all that different than ours. They're not necessarily supportive of their country. It's the country they live in. But even there, you know, I saw a lot more freedom of speech. I attended three women's conferences over a four-day period. I found the women, again, more communicative, more feminist, more open to, you know, criticizing their government. But they're not doing it in a way that, you know, would be sort of a pussy riot type of way. Mm -hmm. They're doing it in a more methodical, behind-the-scenes way to try to get, for instance, legislation back in place that would criminalize domestic violence because last year they decriminalized domestic violence and it's had a negative ramification. So I was very pleased to see that the women I was meeting with were very focused on constructive ways to get their government to meet their needs. 
So I would say that overall there were a lot of positive things in all three of the countries I visited recently. And while certainly Russia's role in Crimea and eastern Ukraine is devastating and unacceptable, on a people-to-people -people level, I find that there is a lot to be optimistic about because there are sort of parallel movements going on in these countries. What kind of an effect or impact would you say that your work, the empowering of women that you're doing, does it spill over into the, um, the power structures? Does it trickle up? Well, certainly in Ukraine, I see women taking increasingly active roles I mean, it was just maybe, I don't know, 18 months, two years ago that Ukraine upgraded its domestic violence laws. They put in things like uh, restraining orders, things that are very common in, in the West. And um, I'm seeing them hold hearings in Ukraine on these kinds of issues. And women's voices are being heard very, very strongly uh, on public radio. We have a show right now on the Romatsky Radio. And uh, it's on women's health. Um, we're finding you know, a very good receptivity to talking very candidly about women's health in Ukraine. You know, whether it's taking place at the Verkhovna Rada stage, Verkhovna Rada, or at the Duma, you know, women's voices certainly are not being heard nearly enough yet at the governmental level. But at the local level, we're starting to see a lot more women's voices bubble up. I think the decentralization process in Ukraine bodes well in some communities for getting more women to be activists. So, again, guardedly optimistic. Only time <laughs> will, will tell if, in fact, all of the dreams of the revolution will be realized. But people are working very hard to get women's voices heard there. It's interesting that we started out speaking about um, this being a, uh, a project specifically geared at Jewish women, but you're speaking on really a much broader level. And you've got groups that work with Jewish women who are reclaiming, like Ukrainian women, I guess, who are discovering, rediscovering their Jewish roots. But you're also working in a broader, on a broader level. You've got interfaith groups as well that you're working with. Yeah, so we start in the Jewish community, and then we form interfaith coalitions with uh, people of all different backgrounds to work on women's issues. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, really critical. I think that, you know, one of the things that I, I appreciate the most about the model, which I didn't create, it was created by our founder, Sally Grass, is it's a social work model. And one of the reasons why Feldstein is such a good match for us is that, you know, we have more than 70 groups in Ukraine, and then we have all these interfaith partners. And so we will be able to bring this program not only to our initial groups, but then to share it with our interfaith partners and really look at the ramifications for society as a whole to deal with its history. So we're just so appreciative to have this content so that we can bring it out. It's I think it's so much more effective when nonprofits can build on each other's mm -hmm. work. And I think it is a particularly positive thing to be able to not just do it in the Jewish community, but then to bring it to the society as a whole. And so one of the things we look at is because so many women are school teachers and social workers and involved in the community at large, is that our hope is, is that we will not only do these programs in faith settings, but then we will bring them into the school system, we'll bring them into the workplace, and look for opportunities where people can really talk about, you know, the history and, and the future. Mm -hmm. um, what we will do with Allison and the Feldstein Society is create a variety of ways that people can observe in their community individually and in groups. And then we will offer them this platform and at, at the most bare minimum, our hope is, is that there will be 200,000 candles lit in memory of the 200,000 who died. Mm -hmm. And we will ask people if they, they do this in their home, they'll photograph it, they'll upload it, and they'll see that there are people, you know, not only throughout Ukraine, but throughout the entire region, and then globally, who care about this history and can recognize that the Holocaust was not the beginning of this tragedy it was the natural continuation and that we have to have a memory of the lead up to the ultimate Holocaust so that, again, we don't want to ever see it repeated in history. 
there are genocides going on worldwide at all times. There's a group called Jewish World Watch that wants people to understand that while the Jewish community has been very strong advocates for never again in Jewish life, that even to this day there are other genocides going on around the world and we have to be ever vigilant and, and devote the resources necessary to make sure that there isn't another population that experiences the horror of the Holocaust. But we are. We, we still are struggling with these issues. It's a, it's a lifetime work. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. And good luck in all your endeavors. And hope to speak with you again in the near future, Karen. And you too, Allison. Oh, thank you so much, Paulina. I was speaking with Allison Zivin, who works with the Felstein Society in New York, and with Karen Gershon, Executive Director of Project Kesher. You can find out more about their organizations at their websites, felstein.org and projectkesher.org. This is Pavlina, producer and host of Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio. Thanks so much for listening. Shalom. Ukrainian Jewish Heritage is brought to you by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, based in Toronto, Ontario. To find out more about their work, visit their website and follow them on Facebook and Twitter. Transcripts and audio files of this and earlier broadcasts of Ukrainian Jewish Heritage are available at their website, ukrainianjewishencounter.org, as well as at the Nasholos website, www.nasholos.com. Canada's National Ukrainian Festival in Dauphin, Manitoba offers the very best in Ukrainian culture, music, food and dancing August long weekend. Right now, your early bird weekend pass is only $90 and includes all of the on-site attractions. It's a perfect stocking stuffer. Day passes and camping passes are also available. Don't miss Canada's National Ukrainian Festival in Dauphin, Manitoba, August 2nd to 4th. Order your tickets and more info at cnuf.ca.
that was the Svalava Kozachuk by Yale Strom. A bit of klezmer for you there. And Yale Strom is an uh, American klezmer artist and also an aficionado of uh, the history of klezmer. And uh, he did a definitive biography, I'd say, of Dave Terrace, who had Ukrainian roots and went on to become called the King of Klezmer. And uh, you can check the Nasholos Audio Archives, Ukrainian Jewish Heritage, on the website if you missed that story. Again, that was Yale Strom with Svalava Kozachok. Well, Hanukkah is over, and uh, St. Nicholas Day on the Gregorian calendar was over, but it's coming up on the Julian calendar, and of course, St. Nicholas is all about Christmas, too. So I promised you a pre-Christmas song, so here is the children of the Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky Ukrainian School of Montreal with Zane Zelane, a tribute to St. Nicholas. <laughs> З янголятами малими, і з вінками голосними, і з собою забери, чемним діточкам дари. Nash Holos Ukrainian Roots Radio, our flagship show in Vancouver, which comes to you Saturdays from 6 to 7 p.m. here on AM 1320 CHMB on the radio dial and online at am1320.com, as well in international syndication on PCJ Radio International. In between broadcasts, please visit our website for transcripts and audio files of interviews and features, information about the show, and of course, podcast links to stream or download. There's a link to our Patreon site there as well, where you'll find playlists, proverbs, and other extra features for patrons and donors. I do hope you'll engage with me there and support the show by following our page or becoming a patron. Incidentally, you can also support the show at no cost to you through the Amazon links found at the Nasholus website, www.nasholus.com. I love to hear from you, so please send your suggestions, dedications, and requests. Your comments are always welcome. And our proverb of the week translates as, He who is not afraid to speak the truth is worthy of respect. Well, with that, we've come to the end of our program, so one last toe tapper for you, A Kolomeka by Peter Lamb. I'm Pavlina, on behalf of all of us here at Nash Hollis and AM 1320, thanks for listening, and Dobranich! <laughs> Oh, man.
Yeah. <laughs> 